Hi, my name is Aaron Grossberg. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Radiation Medicine at OHSU. Welcome to my virtual lecture. Today I'll be talking about radiation therapy for gastrointestinal malignancies. So just to review, what do I mean by gastrointestinal malignancies? Well, it's a wide grouping that includes basically anything starting at the esophagus and going the entire way down to the anus, including the majority of the contents of the abdominal cavity. Cancers that occur um, proximal to the esophagus, or in other words, those of the mouth, the throat, and the neck, are generally um, cared for by specialists in head and neck malignancies and won't be covered in today's lecture. But what will we talk about? We're going to talk a little bit about all of the cancers listed to the right. Esophageal, gastric, hepatocellular, cholangiocarcinoma, or those are uh, cancers that arise from the bile ducts. Pancreatic cancers, small bowel cancers, colon cancers, rectal cancers, and anal cancers. One thing the majority of these cancers have in common is that they are predominantly adenocarcinomas, and that's because most of the GI tract is lined with columnar epithelium or uh, glandular epithelial cells. The exceptions to this are anal cancer, which is um, generally a squamous cell carcinoma, and um, esophageal cancer, which can come in either the flavors of adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, and then hepatocellular carcinoma, which is um, really neither uh, an adenocarcinoma nor a squamous. Um, and then finally, there are neuroendocrine tumors that we will not be talking about today, as radiation doesn't play much of a role in those. Now, what's kind of neat about um, radiation for gastrointestinal tumors is that you get a real appreciation for what really defines the role of radiation in any tumor site. Um, and the simplest way to think about this is the balance between um, effectiveness and toxicity, or the therapeutic ratio. This really depends on the tumor radiosensitivity, the tumor size, and the proximity and tolerance of surrounding normal tissue. And what all these do, and I'll show in the next few slides, is they play into the amount of radiation we're going to need to give to have the effect we want, which is to kill all the cancer cells, and yet not cause the patient irreversible harm. <clears throat> and because um, the gastrointestinal tract has so many organs pressed so closely together, you really have to... to um, dissect these differences in radio sensitivity and radio resistance to be able to, to effectively um, use radiation. So the first concept um, that I want to bring up is the fact that the necessary radiation dose increases with size. Although the doses shown here are just for example, um, they are doses we do use in the clinic commonly. And if you look towards the left, when we think of subclinical disease or microscopic disease, that requires a relatively low dose of radiation to take care of those cells. And that's oftentimes the kind of dose we're giving in the adjuvant or neoadjuvant setting when surgery is called upon to remove the majority of the disease. If radiation itself is meant to be the primary um, modality to tumorocidal mod modality, then we have to increase the dose uh, to make sure that we can kill all the cells in the tumor. And you can see um, that as the tumor gets bigger, the dose that we need to kill those tumors increases. But the dose needed to kill a tumor also varies depending on what kind of tumor it is, because not all tumors or normal tissues are equally sensitive to radiation. So when we think about um, the normal tissues then that we have to protect, there's one important concept that we need to think about, in the, especially in the case of the uh, gastrointestinal tract, and that is um, that of tissue organization. So tissue organization is really based on the concept of functional subunits and not necessarily the actual physical structure of the, the, the tissue. The idea here is that a serial tissue organization is one in which damage to one of the functional subunits of the tissue or of the organ makes the organ no longer function normally. The quintessential example of this is the spinal cord, 
where um, any sort of myelopathy basically can cause complete paralysis or um, uh, paresthesia, um, effectively making the organ no longer function. Similarly, in the luminal organs that make up the gut, if you have too much dose go to one area of those organs, it's less that the rest of the organ no longer functions and more that you've caused an irreversible damage to that small area uh, that can cause ulceration or perforation and actually lead to the patient's death. In the case of a serial organ, the most important thing we think about is the highest point dose because it's the dose given to one area that can make the difference between whether or not that tissue functions normally anymore. In a parallel structure, um, the organ's made of independent functional units, and if you were to damage one or more functional units, the remaining ones can take care of the majority of that function. Uh, the most obvious example is the lungs, where it's parallel that we, in that we have two separate lungs. But uh, tissues like the lung and kidneys are also parallel in that um, there are multiple functional units, be they the alveoli or the um, glomeruli, that um, are not all needed for the organ to take care of its general physiologic role. Somewhat surprising to add in the parallel category would be the liver because it is only one organ. However, the liver is essentially made out of um, many independently functioning uh, subunits and damage to one of those areas, um, as long as there's adequate tissue remaining, uh, does not necessarily dramatically impact um, uh, the function of the organ as, as a whole. In the case of a parallel structure, the mean dose or the dose to a, a certain volume of tissue is what's important. And that's shown here on the next slide where we consider on the left um, serial organs in which the, we're very careful never to cross the maximum dose and our, our constraints for, for normally or conventionally fractionated radiation are shown on the left there. And we are very worried predominantly about that max dose. On the right, thinking about um, parallel organs, we're much more concerned about the mean dose to the entire organ or the volume of that organ that receives greater than a given dose. And these numbers are derived empirically from um, essentially seeing at what point patients uh, started to have major dysfunctions after radiation therapy historically. Now the necessary radiation dose, as I mentioned before, that increases with size, you can now appreciate having seen what, the, what those um, maximum doses that can be tolerated by the different tissues are, that in the majority of the GI tract, we really can only give a dose that is adequate to kill subclinical disease. And so the main role of radiation is that to, to function in the neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting to help um, improve the outcomes um, after surgery, surgical removal, and to help take care of uh, and sterilize microscopic disease that may, be, um, may not be visible but may be transiting through the lymphatic system in high risk areas. And that's shown here, as you can see, the role of radiation for many tissue types, esophageal, gastric, pancreatic, um, rectal, is generally neoadjuvant or adjuvant. The only cancer in which radiation is absolutely the standard of care as the primary upfront therapy is um, anal cancer. Although there is a role in some esophageal cancers that cannot go to surgery, uh, similarly, some gastric cancers that can't go to surgery and um, um, hepatocellular carcinomas or cholangiocarcinomas that can't go to surgery. But again, that's not because it's the primary treatment choice, but rather because surgery is, for one reason or another, not an option. So we're going to start by talking about anal cancer, which is the quintessential um, example in the gastrointestinal tract of a radiation responsive cancer. Indeed, radiation is the primary curative treatment modality for all patients with non-metastatic anal cancer. And the role of radiation in this case is to kill all of the tumor, both the gross disease 
and the microscopic disease. It's administered in anal cancer pretty much universally with concurrent chemotherapy. And the reason that we do that is to improve the, um, the effect of radiation without having to increase the dose. And this allows us to sort of differentially take advantage of the fact that chemotherapy um, makes cancers more susceptible to radiation therapy in, in a way that's more dramatic than how it impacts your normal tissues. So we'll start by asking a very simple question, which is what is the anus? So about 8,000 people uh, get anal cancer a year with, and about 1,000 die. This incidence has increased by uh, nearly twofold over the past 30 years. And the um, median age is in the low 60s and seems to be trending younger. And this is most likely driven by the primary risk factor for anal cancer, which is um, human papillomavirus. Um, Depending on the series, somewhere between 86 and really 100% of cases are HPV positive. Um, and if you look at the other risk factors, including history of cervical, vulvar, or vaginal cancers, also HPV-driven cancers, or immunosuppression, which uh, allows for the development of squamous cell carcinomas, or a history of sexually transmitted disease, which can function as a surrogate for human papillomavirus risk, um, as, as can receptive anal intercourse, you see that really all the risk factors revolve predominantly around either uh, HPV infection or immunosuppression. And then of course, smoking, which always increases the risk of squamous cell carcinomas. The staging shown here, we're not going to talk much about it except to show as an example that T staging is really based on the size of the primary tumor. That in the case of nodal uh, staging in, in anal cancer, all of them in the latest uh, staging guidelines have been changed to subgroups of N1 disease because it turned out that uh, calling them N2 and N3 uh, was a little misleading as those didn't seem to impact survival much. And you can see how the stage grouping works below. Effectively, you have to be T4 or node positive to have stage 3 disease. So we'll use a case to, to, to describe the role of radiation in anal cancer here. Um, In this case, we have a 72-year-old female with a history of rectal pain and bleeding. On exam, there's a visible four centimeter mass in the perianal canal at three o'clock with a negative uh, pelvic exam and no palpable inguinal lymph nodes. A biopsy of the lesion confirms moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Now we are talking about cancer and we're talking about radiation, but this is just a reminder that even as very specialized cancer doctors, we have to consider the full spectrum of differential for all of our patients. Um, it's not actually that uncommon to be consulted to see and treat a patient who you later discover may not actually have a diagnosis of cancer. And so we always like to make sure of that up front. Um, so there are far more common causes of rectal pain and bleeding than anal cancer, including hemorrhoids or diverticulosis, inflammatory bowel disease, a rectal or colon cancer, and even prior radiation, which can cause subsequent rectal bleeding. In this case, we know we have anal cancer, and so we want to make sure we do a full sexual history and test the anal sphincter function. The reason that radiation therapy is preferable to surgery <clears throat> in anal cancer is really because it allows us to preserve the organ or preserve the anus. If the anus doesn't function well as a result of the tumor, then the advantages of doing radiation are limited and we can consider whether uh, surgery itself may have an important role in removing the disease. Um, on exam, you want to make sure that you do endoscopy so you can actually see the uh, tumor and note the extent of circumferential involvement. You really need to do a careful exam because you can't always see all these things clearly on your imaging and you'll want to refer back to your notes. Um, it turns out physical exam is important even for those of us that spend lots of time looking at imaging. And then you want to check the inguinal lymph nodes because that's one of the main drainage courses for the um, for, for anal cancers. It's one of the first echelon nodes. Um, and biopsy those nodes if they are suspicious. And finally, you want to do a pelvic examination in women because, again, of that relationship with HPV 
um, infection and the fact that uh, uh, you do see multiple primary HPV related tumors sometimes with anal cancer. In the lab, you'll want to make sure you check the HIV status and CD4 count of the patient. And then for imaging, you want to get a contrast enhanced CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And really, the vast majority of these patients get a PET scan. Um, the PET scan is particularly helpful to show small nodal metastases that you might not be able to differentiate on a normal CT. And um, PET CT really does change nodal status in about 30% of the cases. So here you can see on the left, this is a CT pelvis with contrast. And you may note that the lighter gray uh, mass right there in the center of uh, the patient's um, scan uh, is the anal cancer. And even if you can see it, you'll also note that that is not the clearest thing to see. In many cases, it doesn't show up this clearly. And so the PET scan is shown on the right where the, uh, the glowing corresponds to increased uptake of glucose. It can be very helpful for defining exactly where the cancer is. Our target when we treat anal cancer is to not just treat the cancer, but also treat the area at risk. Remember, this is the primary treatment modality. So if we fail in this setting and the patient has a recurrence of their tumor, then um, they have to go on to salvage treatment, which in many cases can, is um, extremely morbid, such as a pelvic, pelvic exenturation. So it's our job to define the areas at greatest risk and make sure that we cover them appropriately. In the case of this patient, we have the anal cancer and anal canal shown in cyan, that volume shown in cyan, the involved lymph nodes shown in magenta, and that's the node with a little bit of a margin around it to account for the fact that the node can move around inside the patient and the patient can move a few millimeters day to day on the table. And finally, we have the volumes that correspond to the at-risk lymph nodes. And these are the first echelon of drainage from the um, tumors. And as I'll show you in a moment, these are the areas in which you're most likely to see a, uh, a nodal metastasis. The perirectal, internal iliac, presacral, external iliac, and inguinal lymph nodes. And why the inguinal lymph nodes? Well, you may recall that um, distal to the dentate line, the venous drainage from, um, actually does not go up through the hemorrhoidal um, vessels anymore or the perirectal vessels, but instead actually will come down through the inguinal vessels and go up through the, the femoral and external iliac. And so in that case, um, anything that extends below the dentate line, as many anal cancers really do, um, threatens the uh, um, inguinal lymph nodes. And we want to make sure that we account for that risk by covering the inguinal lymph nodes and then where the inguinal nodes drain to, which is the external iliac nodes. Otherwise, we follow essentially the perirectal um, drainage pattern. And you can see here is the, the authors of this paper that uh, showed all the locations of positive lymph nodes that they've seen in their series of anal cancer patients. And you can see that it really does correspond to the entire volume that we are treating in this case. After we plan our treatment, it looks something like this. And this is using intensity modulated radiation therapy, which is effectively breaking a beam up into hundreds or really thousands of micro beams and putting them together so that you can paint your dose in three dimensions. Um, the different squiggly lines, um, as you've learned in this course, correspond to different dose levels and, and, and the areas uh, encompassed by each. And in this case, we'll treat the, the tumor and involved nodes to one dose and the uninvolved at-risk lymph nodes to a lower dose. And that corresponds both to the radiosensitivity of um, anal cancer, which is a relatively radiosensitive tumor, as well as the, uh, the size of the um, disease that we are accounting for. And we deliver this with concurrent chemotherapy, most commonly mitomycin C along with 5-FU. Uh, some centers use cisplatin and 5-FU. In clinical trials, these have been very similar in terms of their um, outcomes. Uh, mitomycin is still the preferred regimen as the data are a little bit more solid for it, although the toxicities are worse. And what are those toxicities and what does it look like? Um, 
Well, the most common toxicities we deal with are radiation dermatitis or sort of a radiation burn. And what you see here um, is a sort of grade two to, to moving into grade three radiation dermatitis where we've got desquamation and that desquamation is moist indicating um, that there's a lot of inflammation there and there's some difficulty um, healing and that we've lost our, bar our physical barrier. So in the case that we've lost our barrier, we wanna make sure we treat these patients with an antibiotic um, cream like Sylvadine that provides both a barrier as well as um, prevents uh, infection from taking root in the skin. Because it's important in these patients to try to get through the entire course of treatment without taking a break. You also commonly see fatigue. You may see cytopenias generally related to the chemotherapy. Diarrhea is common and we treat that with anti-diarrheals. Rectal bleeding can occur um, years, months to years really after the treatment is finished and it's something that we have to be mindful of because you do not want to biopsy um, the rectum of a patient uh, who's had previous radiation there. And um, sterility, certainly, um, as the, uh, the gonads are generally included within the radiation volume or get enough dose to cause sterility. And then in women, vaginal stenosis, stenosis and sexual dysfunction can be a real issue. And um, we actually provide uh, counseling and, and, and some tools and therapy advice on how to mitigate the sexual dysfunction that can occur downstream from anal cancer um, treatment. The outcomes for this disease are actually quite good. Localized disease, you see greater than 80% survival at five years. Once you have node positive disease, that number drops to about 60%. And in metastatic disease, it's down to about 30% at five years, which shows us both that this is an effective therapy and yet there's a lot of room to gain. Thus far, we have not seen any improvement in these outcomes with the addition of chemotherapy, although um, additional agents are currently under invest investigation to improve these numbers. So to show a slightly different view of the role of radiation in this disease, we're gonna move up a few centimeters proximally to the rectum. Now, unlike anal cancer where radiation is the primary curative modality, in rectal cancer, the role of radiation is largely um, that in the adjuvant or neoadjuvant setting. And we really do prefer neoadjuvant setting for reasons I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, so the role in this case is twofold. First of all, to improve margin negative or R0 resection. It's important that you don't leave any disease behind when you're cutting it out, especially when you remember that it only takes one cell to cause a recurrence, um, and to sterilize the microscopic disease that may be in the lymphatics. We generally treat with concurrent chemotherapy, although now there, we're also using short course radiation for rectal cancer that does not include concurrent chemotherapy. And the indication for this is generally muscle invasive, or T3 rectal cancer, or node positive rectal cancer. And what these really tell us is that uh, a cancer is, um, is threatening to go beyond what could be removed safely surgically, and that there could be microscopic disease left over. And that's what we're trying to account for. So to review the anatomy of the rectum, you know, where does the rectum end and the sigmoid colon begin, um, it's, it turns out that, that there is an actual anatomic definition for that, and that is at the reflection of the peritoneum. So the rectum itself is a retro or infraperitoneal structure, and anything that's above that peritoneal um, uh, reflection is broadly considered the colon. Um, it's important to note that the mesorectum, or the area there around the rectum that provides so much of the vasculature to the rectum, is permeated with, is with rich lymphatics, um, and that, that there's a very high risk of uh, nodal metastatic spread for um, advanced tumors in there. Um, the drainage patterns are through predominantly the hemorrhoidal vessels and the um, internal iliac vessels, as well as the obturator and presacral vessels. Although the upper, upper third of the rectum can drain to the superior hemorrhoidal and inferior mesenteric vessels. In terms of epidemiology, rectal cancer is the third most common cancer in both men and women in the U.S., as well as the third leading cause of cancer death. The risk factors here are mostly related to age and uh, general 
unhealthy lifestyle, although um, certain inherited cancer syndromes such as FAP or HNPCC, also known as Lynch syndrome, um, dramatically increase the risk, as does inflammatory bowel disease. In terms of reversible risk factors, um, eating a high-fat, fiber, low-fat diet helps, avoiding smoking and alcohol help, and staying active and avoiding obesity or, or things that put you at risk for, for diabetes can help. In terms of the treatment paradigms, um, for Early localized rectal cancer radiation doesn't really play a role. This is predominantly a surgical disease, which may or may not involve chemotherapy. Um, in the metastatic setting, the role of radiation really depends on the extent of metastatic disease and the response to chemotherapy. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that at the end of this lecture. But the real um, opportunity for um, uh, radiation to play a role in rectal cancer and the so-called locally advanced these are the either muscle invasive or node positive cancers. And there are two general paradigms, although they're both uh, trimodality paradigms. Um, the sort of standard way to look at this is to do chemoradiation up front. So that's radiation therapy with a concurrent um, fluoropyrimidine chemotherapy, followed by surgery and then uh, about six months of chemotherapy. More common these days, um, more and more common these days, is what we call total neoadjuvant therapy, in which the patients receive chemotherapy up front, followed by chemoradiation, and then are restaged, <clears throat> and some go to surgery to complete the trimodality therapy, and some actually go on to observation if there's evidence that there is a complete response. And data suggests that about 20% of patients may be able to get through this treatment course without surgery, um, and, and without any increased risk of recurrence or death. And so that's becoming a more popular um, approach. When we do treat this, it's very similar to the anal cancer fields that I showed you before, except we don't need to cover those external iliac or inguinal nodes unless the cancer is directly invading the anus or invading a structure that drains to the external iliac nodes. And so, um, we can treat a slightly smaller volume, and that allows us to use a uh, less advanced radiation technique, this 3D conformal technique, where the picture on the left shows us the shape of a beam coming from posterior to anterior, and the picture in the middle shows us what the lateral beams look like. And on the picture on the right, you can see outlined by the blue um, line, the area that's receiving the full dose, uh, in this case, um, being delivered, really only is where these three beams cross. And again, the goal is to ensure a margin negative resection for any tumor that's threatening that margin and sterilize microscopic disease in the, in the regional lymphatics. And altogether, the major goal of this is to decrease the risk of local or regional recurrence. The other vital um, piece of uh, rectal cancer therapy is known as the total mesorectal excision. This is a sharp dissection through the fascia surrounding um, uh, beyond the perirectal fat. This clears all the lymph nodes. You remove the rectum en bloc along with the entire mesorectum, and it lowers the risk of a positive radial margin and dramatically lowers the risk of local recurrence. Now, what are the advantages of pre-op versus post-op treatment? In theory, both should account for that microscopic disease risk equivalently. And indeed, when these have been compared, there's no difference in survival. But in the preoperative case, we can visualize the gross tumor and better define what our tumor or what our radiation fields should be. The vasculature is intact, so we should be able to get away with a slightly lower dose because um, radiation requires well tissue to be well oxygenated. Um, the irradiated tissue is actually removed after treatment in the majority of cases. So um, that means that the majority of the opportunities for toxicity are also removed. Treating upfront can improve the rates of sphincter preservation, especially for low-lying rectal tumors that may otherwise require um, uh, a surgery that removes the um, anal sphincter. In this case, um, 
some of these patients can avoid uh, permanent colostomy. And um, something somewhat to our surprise is multiple studies have now shown that there's an improvement in local control associated with delivering the uh, radiation before surgery as opposed to after, and that's shown on the right. It's not clear whether that has to do with a relative hypoxia in the postoperative setting or perhaps is due to um, improved uh, margin negative resection rate. Um, but in both of those things can, can enhance that local control. And there's greater treatment adherence because patients who are receiving this treatment up front are much more likely to get through the full course than a patient who's also recovering from surgery. And finally, this allows us the opportunity for non-surgical management, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, patients really do like the opportunity to avoid a, um, a, a resection of their rectum if they can help it. Now, if we move a few centimeters more proximal, we find that we've now traversed the full spectrum of possible roles of radiation. We've gone from radiation being the primary curative modality in the anus to being a supportive modality in the rectum to having no role in colon cancer. So these cancers are often lumped together, as are these tissues. So what's so special about the rectum? Well, the rectum is tethered to the posterior retroperitoneum. This creates a defined volume um, and allows us to shrink the field that we actually are treating, whereas the more mobile colon, we have to account for all of the potential motion of the area that we'd like to treat. The rectum is also surrounded by relatively radio-resistant organs, such as the bladder, the prostate, or the uterus, um, musculature, and bones, whereas the colon is really surrounded by more bowel, and kidney, and those are all radiosensitive organs that you have to be careful about delivering radiation to. Finally, the rectum has a very identifiable and volumetrically limited lymphatic drainage, whereas the colons is less anatomically limited and can move around. Again, forcing us to treat a larger area with a larger dose that puts more tissue at risk. And it's that risk-benefit ratio that falls out of our favor to the point at which we do not treat uh, colon cancers typically with any radiation. So I want to give one more example of a way that we like to use radiation um, for gastrointestinal tumors. And the previous examples can actually be applied to other parts of the GI tract. Um, the example for rectal cancer really applies to our approach towards esophageal cancer and to some extent, uh, in some cases, for um, hepatobiliary tumors. Um, but what about the liver, which we talked about earlier as a parallel organ? This might be an opportunity to use an increase in dose to help control uh, tumor. And in fact, that's, that's what we're going to talk about now, is this also makes up a very large part of our practice. So in this case, the role of radiation is oftentimes local consolidation. And I say consolidation and not cure because... Um, Seldom is radiation thought of as the curative modality alone for any upper uh, abdominal tumors, although we are trying to uh, expand that role, um, that careful balance of effectiveness and safety has to be respected. But the liver is a very common site for metastasis, and there can be um, uh, primary tumors there as well, and sometimes these are not amenable to surgical resection. And that is where having being able to deliver a high dose of radiation to kill the tumor can be helpful in, um, in po potentially curing the patient or at least decreasing their, their, their cancer burden and improving the effectiveness of other systemic therapies. So... We're going to talk about liver metastases because they're about 20 times more common than primary liver tumors. And the reason is that there's a dual blood supply. Both the hepatic artery and the portal vein provide blood to the liver. And really the portal vein is bringing in all the blood from the, from the lower GI tract. And, and that encompasses basically every other um, gastrointestinal malignancy site. So tumors really, GI tumors really like to go to the liver, breast tumors go to the liver, lung, lung cancers go to the liver, and they do it frequent, frequently. And what's interesting is we talked earlier about the use of radiation for rectal cancer and it admitted up front that we were not giving enough radiation to actually kill the tumor in most cases, but rather to kill microscopic disease. But in the liver, we can increase that dose and we can give a big enough dose to potentially kill the tumor 
supposing there's enough healthy liver around. And as you can see, there are multiple local therapies for liver metastases. And it, what is not an uncommon situation is that we see um, a patient who has only one or a couple of metastases all located in the liver. And this gives us an opportunity to potentially get rid of all of the metastatic disease and treat the primary tumor and maybe find a window for cure for some metastatic patients. So the preferred um, treatment is generally surgery, but the mass majority of patients who have uh, metastatic disease to the liver are not resectable. And there's multiple other treatments like radiofrequency ablation or cryotherapy or transarterial chemoembolization that we won't be talking about now. Um, but all of these have some limitations and, um, and, uh, and radiation is becoming um, a more and more popular option in this case. And specifically stereotactic radiation therapy. So, so how does that differ? Well, before I showed you a couple examples where we treated relatively large areas of tissue with a low dose of radiation each day, and we thought a lot about what dose the surrounding tissue could um, tolerate. In the case of stereotactic radiation, we give a high dose each day of over only a few treatments, five or fewer. And the goal of doing this is to kill the tumor cells completely within the tumor, um, but, but also a small rim of tissue, of normal tissue around it, will be generally completely ablated. And so we're less worried about killing um, normal tissue and more thinking about what the volume of that tissue is. Uh, again, getting back to the parallel versus serial organ differentiation. And the way we do this is we have multiple beams converge on a small tumor that's very precisely defined using imaging. And we use some techniques to limit the motion of that tumor so that we can really shrink down the size of our field. In this case, we can see here a, a centimeter, that, or excuse me, a tumor that measures a couple of centimeters, about three centimeters in each dimension. And we define this area, we treat the tumor with a very small margin around it to a dose of 50 gray and only four treatments. Earlier I said we treated that patient with anal cancer to 50 gray and 25 treatments, or that patient with rectal cancer to 50 gray and 25 treatments. Doing that same dose over the course of only four treatments effectively increases the um, radiation dose we've delivered by about two and a half fold and allows us to completely kill the cells within that, even in a radio-resistant tumor type like colorectal cancer. The toxicity we worry about with, ra with radiating the liver is called radiation-induced liver disease or radiation hepatitis, and it presents like a hepatitis, right upper quadrant pain, ascites, elevated liver function tests, usually a month or two after radiation. It's caused by endothelial cell injury that leads to fibrin deposition and venous occlusion of the liver. And the treatment of this is mostly supportive, as with the majority of liver pathology. But um, although most re recover, this can be fatal, and it's something that we tr try very hard to avoid. And how we avoid this is we try to pick patients who have a suitable volume of healthy liver. And that's not to say a suitable volume of untreated cirrhotic liver. It makes a difference. So we use labs to help us um, evaluate whether there's enough healthy liver. And we also use um, a volumetric assessment. Sometimes we can use some advanced imaging to also get an idea of what the true volume of um, functional liver is for these patients. That's the end of this lecture. I'm glad you guys were able to attend it. I wish I could be there to answer questions and hopefully we'll all be back, uh, we'll all be back before too long. In the interim, please um, be safe, take care of one, one another and uh, we'll see you on the backside of this thing.